welcome everyone to our event today. My name is Gloria Lane and I'm the manager of the Women's Center here at Lakeland, where we proudly offer resources, connections, and support for women who want to broaden their horizons and make changes in their lives. We assist women to overcome barriers so that they can reach their educational goals here at Lakeland. Today we are celebrating Black History Month and our 2019 theme, which is Diversity Matters. At the Women's Center, part of our ongoing mission is to explore and promote diversity, validating and celebrating the stories of our women and members of our community. Our series has included recent events such as the Silent Witness Project, the Tuskegee Airmen Harold Brown, International Women's Day, and a variety of other activities. March 2019 will bring this year's Women of Achievement Awards, which will also embody the diversity theme. We believe that a critical part of education is discovering people, practices, and cultures that are new and different from what we know. As a college, one of our most important functions is to offer an opportunity for students to encounter new people and ideas and begin to process and accept them with empathy. This is how we begin to understand that diversity is a positive attribute for our community. Before we introduce our guest speaker, I want to let you know that at the close of the program, we'll be selling um, Ramona's books, and we'll be selling them here up on the stage, so you'll be able to come up the ramp and, uh, and then come down the other side. Please consider buying a book. Um, it helps defray the cost of her speech today, and uh, that means it goes to the valuable work of our Women's Center. So I would like to ask my colleague, Mary Goss Hill, to come to the stage and introduce our special guest. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for coming. It is my pleasure to introduce our speaker. I don't have a bio, but most of you have grown up with Ramona on TV. <laughs> so um, you'll hear her bio as she delivers her presentation. You'll be in for a treat. Thank you for coming. Enjoy. Thank you. <laughs> All right, excuse me if I keep pulling on my dress. You ladies know when the dress is a little tight, I haven't worn this in eight months, and I was like, ooh, this morning, this is a little tight. <laughs> All right, hopefully you'll listen to what I say and not look at how tight my dress is. I'll see you if you're looking. <laughs> But I am delighted to have been asked by Mary Hill to speak on this uh, black, during this Black History Month. Uh, for those of you who don't know much about my career, I am proud that I made history in Cleveland, not only becoming the first black woman to anchor an evening newscast on Cleveland television, I also made women's history by becoming the first woman to ever solo anchor an evening newscast at Channel 3. So I'm so, ex I'm so honored. But you know, as any good story goes, you know it wasn't easy to make that climb. And for over 30 years now, with eight Emmy Awards for excellence in broadcasting, winner of the Edward R. Murrow Award for the breaking news stories of Ariel Castro, unfortunately, that horrible story of, of keeping women captive in his home, to win the Edward R. Murrow Award, which is what journalists strive uh, to win, to break that story. And there are so many more accolades and awards I've received. I just, sometime I ask my, my Lord and Savior, my cup runneth over, no more. I'm not deserving. But I have really worked hard in my career. And for you to understand my story, I really have to take you back to where it all began. It began in a small backwoods rural town of Wilson City, Missouri, population 212, 12 of them being my family. <laughs> 12 of us crammed into a tiny house on a dead-end dirt road, hence the name of the book, A Dirt Road to Somewhere. My mom, we used to call her a preacher because she was raising 10 girls and one boy, and she was so worried about teenage pregnancy 
Every day she'd walk up and down our long, thin hallway saying, I got 10 girls, but hell if I'm going to have 10 grandbabies. You are not going to date until you're 17 or graduating high school. So you guys know, you young people, that's cruel, isn't it? But those were her rules, and we had to abide by them as long as we lived in her house. But my mom used to always say to us that poverty in our family was cyclical, and she wanted to break the cycle. And she pressed education, 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 every day. That's all she talked about. And we were like, Mom, we get it. And she was like, you know, I'm raising you back here on this dead end dirt road that leads to nowhere, but you are going somewhere and you will get an education. You will graduate high school and I want you to go to college. But if you decide you're not going to college, you're out of here. I'm not taking care of you. And so my sisters and I, we would huddle and we'd say, what are you going to do? And what are you going to do? Because we can't stay with mom when we graduate because she's going to put us out. So it was either college, getting a training in something, but we knew we were out of there. And so it was tough growing up because I, I can still vivid re, vividly remember at six years old, my mom huddled us all in our small living room and said, your dad and I are splitting up. I'm not sure how much help he's going to be. I'm not sure if he's going to help take care of you all. But don't you worry. I'm going to take care of you. I birthed you in the world. It's my job to provide for you. Now, as a six-year-old, I was really inquisitive, curious, asked a lot of questions. I should have known I'd become a journalist. <laughs> I was full of questions, but I could comprehend what my mom was saying. And I'm thinking to myself, you're working a factory job, making 4 to $6 an hour, and you're telling us you're going to take care of all 11 of us. For me, that didn't add up. But my mom was creative. Oh my goodness, not only did she raise a garden, she raised small animals, pigs and chickens and ducks and turkeys in the backyard, and those were all supplements for, for our food. My mom was determined that she would not go on welfare, and she got that hard work, determination, and grit from her daddy. And unfortunately, she lost him at tw uh, when she was 12 years old. But she was just adamant, I will not go on welfare. I will take care of you myself. And that's what mom did. Now, being a middle child, I was number six, and I was a good child. I did everything I was supposed to do, went to school, got good grades. My sisters hate this part of the speech. But uh, <laughs> unlike them, I was no trouble. But unfortunately, when you're not a problem child, you don't get any attention from your mother because she was always busy with the baby or the older one who was trying to sneak and date. So there I was doing everything I was told to do, so I didn't get much attention. And I craved attention with my mom. So I remember every single evening when the CBS Evening News would come on, there was my mom watching. And I would ease up, and she, there she'd be sitting on her favorite chair watching the CBS Evening News with Walter Cronkite. And so I would ease up into her lap to watch this man with gray hair and big eyes read the news. And I loved his voice. And my mom had three loves in her life, her Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, Dr. Martin Luther King, and Walter Cronkite. <laughs> And trust me, when he was on, you did not disturb her. And so I would climb into her lap at six years old, and I would watch the news with her. And I would see these horrifying pictures. This was the late 60s. I'd see you know, people rioting, Dr. King before he was killed, in the streets, marching, demonstrations, fires, police dogs, biting people, police with billy clubs, hitting people. And I was sitting there all wide-eyed, asking my mom, what is happening? Why are people fighting? And my mom didn't shield me from it. She taught me and she said, this is what's going on in the world. That man there is Dr. King. He's fighting for equal rights for, for blacks. And she explained it all. And I'd see Walter Cronkite interviewing presidents and dignitaries. And, and I remember saying to my mom one day at six years old, mom starts saving for college. I'm going to college and I'm going to be just like Walter Cronkite. I'm going to anchor the news. And my mom looked down at me and she said, OK, baby, 
You can do that. And I know my mom, I, looking back now, I know she had no idea how she could ever afford to send me to college. But she made me believe she believed in my dream. And so that's what I did. I continued to get good grades. I went off to college. I majored in broadcast journalism. But boy, my mom always reminded me about my faith and how God will always look over you and watch out for you. And hence, on my cover of my book, I say, God places gifts in your path. It's up to you to recognize them. My mom told me that when I left home at 17 years old, headed to college. And those words still ring true for me today. When I got to college and I went into the financial aid office, Mr. Charles Glasper was waiting for me. And I'll never forget his name because it was such a pivotal moment in my life. He called me in and he said, Ramona, I've got some bad news. We've got a mix up in your paperwork. You're $600 short of your tuition. I've called your mom. She doesn't have $600. The bank won't lend her any more money uh, because there were already four of us in college. My mom, this uneducated woman who worked a factory job, put nine kids through college, nine. But unfortunately, when it was my time, we were out of money. And I said to Mr. Glasper, but you don't understand. I have worked so hard to get here. Every adult, every teacher, every counselor, my Lord and Savior, my mom, all my life, you said get good grades. I could go to college. Now you're telling me I have to go home. And he was like, well, go, go home, get a summer job, come back next year when you get the money. And I said, you don't understand, there are no jobs where I come from. It's an economically depressed area. My dream of becoming a journalist will surely die if I go back. And I just started sobbing in front of this man that I didn't know. And he goes, oh, my child, my child, stop it. He said, I've had freshmen in here who decide college isn't for me and I want to go home. He's like, you're the first to cry that you want to stay at our university. So he said, go back to your dorm room. I'm going to find a way to keep you in college. And so he called me the next day and he said, I found you a job on campus. It's going to cover your tuition and you can stay in college. Yes, thank you. And so I got through college, I graduated. And for all you young people, listen to me, because this is the hard part. Because everybody tells you, get that degree, you're armed with that degree, you graduate, and the jobs are going to be waiting for you, right? Wrong. I went to 15, 20 interviews, every radio station, every newspaper, every television station. I heard, no, you're not ready. You're right out of college. You have no experience. Your voice is awful. You need more work. Maybe you should go to grad school. And I'm thinking, oh my goodness, how can I get experience if you don't hire me? And so I was just, you know, really, honey? <laughs> really? I'm trying hard up here. <laughs> I'm going to leave the husband at home next time. Where were we? OK, somebody help me. Where was I? Oh, OK, couldn't get a job. And so he was right. My voice was awful because I grew up in the backwoods of Missouri, and most of my family migrated from Mississippi. And so, you know, I'm all proper now. But, and I say, you know, girl, do you have $40? But back then it was, you got $40? <laughs> Y'all want some pork chops? Girl, open that door. Come in this house. And that's how we spoke. Everybody spoke like that. And so I needed to work on my voice and diction, and I knew that. But I still thought he was cruel. I mean, you could have said it nicer. And so I couldn't get a job. And then I would pray and ask God. And I said, God, I've been a, a good child. I love the Lord. I've done everything right. And now you're telling me I've gone four years through college and I can't get a job. And so uh, the voice of God, I know it was the voice of God, came to me and said, no, you haven't gone everywhere. And I'm like, what do you mean? Yes, I have. I've gone everywhere. No one will hire me. And he said again, no, you have not gone everywhere. 
and the voice was right. I had avoided the one country radio station in town. And you know why I didn't go? Listen to this again, students. I listened to my peers, my girlfriends, said don't even bother going to that country radio station. That's a white radio station. They don't, they don't hire black people. They're never gonna hire you. Why would you even go apply for a job? I listened to them. I didn't go apply for the job. But I've learned in my life that your truth may not be my truth and my truth may not be yours. And so I got up the next day armed with my resume, went in the radio station, it was just my luck, the music director was there. I was hired on the spot. Now granted, they put me on the graveyard shift where no one could hear me. <laughs> but hey, my foot was in the door, I had a job. My favorite listeners were Missouri truckers Oh, they love them some Ramona. <laughs> That's why today, sometimes when I'm on the highway, I'll do like this because I love my truckers. They supported me when I had no one else. They would listen and call in and say, darling, you're sounding really good. <laughs> and I knew they were lying. It was just late night truckers who wanted to talk to a girl. But anyway, they boosted my confidence. And so I got that confidence. I started working on my voice. I was doing interviews and, and writing a lot. And all of a sudden, one of my girlfriends said, Ramona, there's a reporting job open at one of the local television stations, the CBS affiliate. And I immediately thought, oh, no, not that station. That was the guy who was really hard on me. He said my voice was awful. I should consider going back to grad school. And I'm not ready for the business. But I love a challenge, always have. You tell me no, I say yes. And so I called his office and the secretary surprisingly put me through. And he answered the phone, he said, Ramona Robinson. And I thought, oh my God, he remembers my name. He remembers how horrible I am. And that's what I'm thinking. And he said, I notice you've been working on your voice. And I said, I have, how would you know? He said, you work for my favorite radio station. I get up every morning at 5.30 a.m. as you're signing off, and your voice is great. I mean, you have really been working on it. So you see the full circle moment? Had I listened to my peers and not gone into that radio station, I would not have been put on the graveyard shift working till 6 a.m. when the news director, who said I was horrible, would wake up every morning at 5.30 to hear that my voice was progressing. And to make a long story short, I got the job. I got the job. And so I worked there and I learned so much and oh my goodness, I got a chance to cover President Ronald Reagan. Um, I did so many great stories, uh, some not so great. I was uh, chased by a seven foot, 500 pound bear. Yeah, that big sucker bit me too, but I was running. <laughs> you know, I, was, I felt like I was in a horror movie, but it was real. And, you know, usually when the monster comes out, the woman faints and goes, oh! I tell you, that bear, I heard that And something clamped down on my calf, and I didn't even have to look down, because I was doing an interview like this. I didn't even have to look down. I just heard the roar, and something clamped down on my calf, and I immediately, instinctively, I just started running for my dear life. And, um, it's amazing what television news directors will do. I'm thinking because I've been bitten by this bear and they told me to go to the doctor to see if I needed shots. Um, they said, don't even bother coming into the television station. You know, this has been a traumatic day. I get home from the doctor, I turn on the news and I see a tease on the air. I see this tall black woman running, <laughs> running for dear life, and there was this huge bear behind me coming after me, and the anchor is saying, we want you to know Ramona Robinson was chased by a bear today. <laughs> she's okay, but she's at home today. The story coming up at six. And I was mortified. So I was known in town as the bear girl for months. Everyone made fun of me. And my mom promised me that I would never do that again. I got uh, kicked out of a concert, 
Chuck Berry kicked me out of his concert. I was sent into a maximum security male prison. Oh, yeah, I was horrified. Oh, my goodness. I thought I would be separated from the inmates, but no. Oh, you'll have to read about that. But uh, yeah, my husband is going, cut, you're telling the whole book. <laughs> But I had a great time in Missouri. Now it's time to move to a medium market television station. For those of you who don't know, in television, it's small market, medium, large market. I wanted to go to large market, anchor an evening newscast like Walter Cronkite, because that is where the power is, where the money is, where the decision making is. You can determine what you see on television. And I wanted the power to be able to do that. And so I went to South Carolina, but unfortunately, when I entered the business, it was the mid 80s. And the mid 80s is when a lot of women started to infiltrate the news because it had been such a male dominated industry. Every time, a lot of you are too young to know this, but for the older folks, you know you would turn on the news and you'd see one single white male anchoring a newscast. And so in the mid 80s, women and blacks started uh, anchoring the news alongside usually a white male. And there was some resistance, some pushback to that. Some males did not want women, black or white, sitting next to them. They wanted it to remain a solo male anchor business. And so when I went to South Carolina, I actually replaced an older, popular white male. Uh, he was 70 years old. I think they, he was pushed out because they said, you know, um, he was no longer being able to do the job. And so it was an opportunity for me, and I was given his job. And so I had one manager, a female, who I tried to win her over every day. I tried to win this woman over and nothing seemed to work. And so I asked one of my colleagues, what is it? How come she doesn't like me? And uh, he said, well, Ramona, I hear she doesn't care for blacks. And then I also know her. You know, you're a, a tall, thin, beautiful young girl. When you walk in the room, men take notice, and she doesn't like that. And I was like, well, what am I supposed to do about that? And uh, so every day, I come to work excited about reporting. And one day when I walked in, she was so nice to me. I couldn't believe it. I thought, finally, she's warmed up to me. She was like, Ramona, good morning. I'm like, hi, how are you? She said, I've got a great assignment for you today. And I was like, really? I was getting ready to engage her in a conversation. And, and I said, what is it? She said, the Ku Klux Klan is having a rally in South Carolina, and I want you to go cover it. And so I was the only black reporter in the newsroom, and all of my white colleagues were so uncomfortable, they put their heads down, and they just started typing, because they didn't, they they didn't know what to do. And she said, and before you go, the Grand Dragon will be there. I want you to walk up to him and get me a one-on-one -on -one with the Grand Dragon. And so I'm terrified, because I've only seen the Klan in movies or, or in history books. And this woman is telling me, a young black woman, to go not only cover the story, but approach the Grand Dragon to try and get a one-on-one. -on -one. And so even when my photographer and I were pulling up to the rally, the noise was deafening. I could see on one side of the street Klansmen in their robes and hoods chanting, blacks and Jews uh, should be rid of the world. And on the other side of the street, I saw black and white protesters with signs saying, racism is wrong. Go back where you came from. And, and then I saw police a huge police presence with billy clubs out and dogs on leashes and their guns holstered. And I was terrified. I'm like, oh my goodness, this is a, a recipe for a riot. I could be killed today. And my photographer knew how nervous I, I was. And, and I was just peering out of the window in disbelief with my mouth open because I had never seen anything like it in my life. And, and I remember when I got ready to get out of the car, Florian reached over and grabbed my hand and he said, Ramona, I can tell you are terrified. You don't have to go out there. He said, you stay in here, you lock the car door, I will go out, 
I'll interview the Grand Dragon, and I won't tell anyone you didn't do the story. And boy, <laughs> did I want to take him up on it. I wanted to lock that door and say, see ya. I'll be right here when you get back. But the journalist in me would not allow that. I knew I had to get out of that car, and I had to face my fear. Hence my book, I had to walk in faith over fear. And I was asking the Lord the whole time, why? Why am I here? How come you have sent me into the line of fire? What am I supposed to learn from this? The Lord was making me strong. He was, because he knew television is a tough business, and if you've got a thin skin, you won't last very long. And so, as I, ah, oh, my husband, he doesn't want me to tell you what happened when I reached that mean old grand dragon. He always says, if I tell you what happened, you won't buy the book. So you're going to have to read the book to know what happened. <laughs> I know, I told you he's a party pooper. You have to read the book. But there were, there were times, you know, she sent me out one day in the afternoon. There was heavy hail. We were reporting golf ball sized hail. And I grew up in Missouri where I was used to tornadoes, but never a hurricane. And Hurricane Charlie had arrived. And of course, she said, Ramona, <laughs> my name was always called for the danger stories. <laughs> Ramona, Hurricane Charlie is coming ashore. I need you to go out there. <laughs> <laughs> and this, this story will be significant because, um, and as a female journalist, it didn't matter. If you were sent to a war-torn um, area, you went. I mean, if you want to do what the guys do, you're sent into the line of battle. You better be ready to do it. And so I just remember that day of never, ever having seen a hurricane. And, and we're just reporting, batten down the hatches, uh, evacuate to higher ground. Police are saying, get out, get out now. Charlie's going to come. The eye of the storm is going to come with, you know, 150 mile hour winds that ended up being 90 mile an hour, but that's still a huge storm. And so my photographer and I are heading down to Folly Beach, South Carolina. We're going down there. We're heading toward the eye of the storm. While you guys are heading to safety, they're sending us out into the, toward the eye of the storm, which I always think makes no sense. I mean, why are you putting my life in danger? I want to run with you. And so as we're heading down there, the winds are just whipping torrential rains. And literally, I say limbs, I think, in the book, but it was literally like branches hitting our windshield as we're driving. And I can see roofs uh, uh, flying off of buildings and houses. And it was so dark, and it was such this whistling sound like a freight train was coming. And we're still heading directly into it. And my photographer gets there at Folly Beach, and he jumps out of the car, and he, he's headed down by the ocean, by the break wall. And I'm still sitting in the car looking around because I've never seen anything like this. And he yells back at me, Ramona, get out of the car. Come on. And so I get out of the car, and I'm standing there next to the brake wall where the waves are just crashing over the brake wall. And I'm still trying to report. And I'm, this is Ramona Robinson. I'm reporting at Folly Beach. And police are saying, evacuate now. Get out now before the storm comes ashore. And, and as I'm talking, and I, unbeknownst to me, a huge 20-foot wave comes over and smacks me in the head. I go falling to the ground. I mean, it was like, <laughs> and I get back up, and I just started reporting again. As I said, I'm Ramona Robinson, and police are saying, get out now. And, and the, my photographer is just dying laughing. The camera is shaking because he's just laughing. And I was like, what's funny? Did I say something wrong? He goes, no. You look like a drowned rat. <laughs> and he said, why are you yelling? I said, because it's horrible. So that was not my finest hour, but you know, I got the story anyway. And so then the, my time in South Carolina gets a little tricky. This is where my faith really played a role in my life. I always thought I had a lot of faith in God. But sometimes your faith can wane. When trouble comes your way and life can be unfair, you can do all the right things and you ask yourself, why me? 
Why is this trouble coming to my household, to my kids? Why are they acting like babies' kids? I'm trying to raise them right. What, what is happening? And so you kind of lose faith because you feel like, my Lord, I've done everything. And so my general manager called me in the office. He praised me for my great work that I had been doing. And he said, I want to sign you to a new three-year contract. And I still had eight months left on my current contract. And I said, well, wonderful. And I said, so does this mean, because I was the weekend anchor, and the weeknight jobs, the evening jobs, those were still reserved for whites. And I said, well, does this mean if I sign this new contract, then when the weeknight job is available, I'll be considered? He goes, no, 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 we're not talking about that. That job isn't available. We're talking about you continuing to do weekends because blacks were reserved to do weekends, early morning, noon shows, but you could not have those power jobs in the evening. And I said, well, I understand that. I know the job isn't available, but if it does become available, would I be considered? And he goes, again, I don't think you hear what I'm saying. No, we're not going to discuss that. And I knew the truth. I knew that Charleston, South Carolina had never had a black male or female evening anchor, and they probably wouldn't. Um, but he said, I don't think you understand. You either sign this contract or you're out of here. And I'm like, what? I said, you just praised me for my great reporting. What are you? And he said, I need you to sign this contract. I need you to consider uh, continuing to work weekends. You go home, I'll give you 24 hours. You come back and let me know tomorrow if you're gonna take it or leave it. And I thought, oh my gosh, this is so unfair. I don't have another job in the waiting. How am I gonna, what am I gonna do? I can't quit my job. And I tossed and turned all night. I prayed, I picked up my Bible and I, I prayed and I asked God, this is another one of those moments where life isn't fair. I didn't do anything wrong, but I'm being pressured to sign a contract when I may never be promoted. And so I know it was the voice of God who said, you go in there and you'll tell them, you'll leave it. I'm like, I will? <laughs> I don't have another job. Who's gonna pay my bills? And so I got up the next morning, I went in, and he said, what's it gonna be? You're gonna take it or leave it? And I said, you've given me no choice. I'm gonna have to leave it. He said, pack up your bags, get out. I packed up my bags in the newsroom, walked out. And when I got to the car, I just cried my eyes out before I even started the car. And I felt really good for standing up for myself for about three weeks until I sent out like 25 audition tapes across the country. I didn't hear from anybody. And so the creditors started calling after a couple of months because my, my savings was being depleted. I couldn't pay my bills. And that was probably the hardest thing for me because my mom, even on her salary, always taught us, you borrow money, you pay it back. You make sure you pay it back. And so all of a sudden, I couldn't pay my bills. And it bothered me so much. I said, OK, I guess my life in television is over. I've got to get a job to take care of myself. So I went to the local department store, and they hired me selling Lancome cosmetics. And I absolutely hated it. And not because that I was selling Lancome cosmetics, because I love making women feel good about themselves, but it wasn't my dream. My dream of anchoring an evening newscast like Walter Cronkite, I felt like it was dead. And so then, when you're at your lowest, when you, you know, I tell you, when you sink down into despair, deep despair, when you can't sleep at night, where my mom used to always say uh, that she would lay awake in the midnight hour, praying and talking to God, I finally knew what that meant because I would lay awake talking to God over and over again. And, and that's when the devil will come in your ear. And he will just play on you, saying, oh, you poor little girl, where is your God now? He has abandoned you, hasn't he? You were dumb enough to go in there and quit that job. But where is your Lord and Savior now when you need him? You, you're no longer in television. You worked all your life to get there. Where is he now? 
And I started to question God. I was like, oh my goodness, is he right? Have you abandoned me? Where are you? You used to talk to me. I hear nothing. Why won't you answer me? I was becoming angry. And even though one of my favorite scriptures, Hebrews 11.1, 1, which says faith is being sure of what you hope for and certain of what you cannot see. I couldn't see what was on the horizon, but God knew. He knew what he had in store for me, but I couldn't see it. I'm living here on earth, and all I see is that I'm in a dead-end job that I hate, and I am not in television anymore. And so my life became an existence of going home from work, crying, eating something, going to bed, getting up, crying, going to work, coming home. And every time I would hit the voice machine, it was a creditor saying, where is it? And a lot of times I just didn't answer because I didn't know where, where it was. And so, because I had bought all this stuff, you know, an apartment, a car, based on my television salary, and now I'm making a Lancome salary, and it was, it was a mess. And so just when I sunk deep down, when I didn't think I could continue anymore, I was so depressed, I didn't want to get out of bed. Just when I got to that moment, I came home one day from work, and the answering machine said three messages. I didn't even want to push play, but something made me push play. And I pushed it, boop, hi Ramona, this is so-and-so in Des Moines, Iowa, got your tape, loved it, would love to fly you out for an interview. Boop, hi Ramona, this is Randy Covington in Philadelphia, KYW, got your tape, would love to fly you out for an interview. Boop. Hi, Ramona. This is Dan Acklin, Cleveland, Ohio. Got your tape. Would love to fly you out for an interview. And oh my God, you guys know how the story goes. I got the job here in Cleveland. That was 31 years ago. 31 years ago. And I didn't know at the time that I would become the first black woman to ever anchor an evening newscast, but all I knew was there was so much hoopla surrounding my hiring. And before my news director hired me, he said, I want you to know the NAACP has been protesting and threatening to boycott Cleveland television stations if they don't see enough representation of blacks on the news. He said, but I want you to know I hired you because you have earned this job. And there were 1,100 applicants that I beat out. And he said, you know why I chose you? He said, I wanted someone who was not only credible, but warm and friendly and kind. And I'm like, really? You saw all that in my tape? <laughs> he said, the first 15 seconds, I knew you were my anchor. He said, I put in that tape, and there was this woman, this beautiful woman, standing there fighting a hurricane. <laughs> and, he said, and he said, you look like a drowned rat. You were knocked down, but you got back up, and without stopping the way the women normally would stop and powder and fix their hair and brush it, he said, you just kept reporting. He said, that told me everything I needed to know about you in those 15 seconds. And so I was so delighted to know that I had made black history in Cleveland. But then, you know, with every good thing, there's always trouble. Some people didn't like the first black woman being hired to anchor a primary newscast. I started getting hateful, ugly letters. And they were postmarked from Akron, and they said they were members of the Ku Klux Klan. And I'm thinking, gosh, did the Grand Dragon follow me from South Carolina? <laughs> They know I'm here now, but it's a different group. And so the letters were so horrible. I, I, I never for, I'll never forget my first one. It said, uh, Cleveland has beautiful white anchors. We don't need N anchors like you. Go back where you came from. And then I'd get letters with uh, pictures of baboons and monkeys, and then my picture. And, and my news director kept a box of tissues on his desk. And every time I walked in with that white envelope, he would hand me the box of tissues, because I was a crybaby. My sisters say I should have been an actress, because I can cry like that. But I'd go in and I'd cry and say, why don't they like me? And I've earned this job. And, and I just felt so much pressure. I felt like, literally, like white people hated me and black people were hailing me as finally. 
And my news director said to me, he said, I know you don't know Cleveland, but I'm telling you, the people who are doing this, they are a small select group of hateful people. They're trying to run you out of town, run you off of a position that you have earned. And he said, what did you tell the plain dealer when they interviewed you? And I said, well, I, I told them how much this moment meant and that I hoped with my hiring, viewers would be able to see that black people are capable of anchoring an evening newscast and have the power to make decisions on what you see in your homes every day. He said, exactly, focus on that. And I'm, my mom wanted me to come home. She was afraid the Klan would find me and, and harm me. But I, once I decided to fight the hate with love and kindness, my whole world changed. I got involved in unity and diversity issues. As a matter of fact, uh, Kent State gave me a diversity and media awards for all of the work I had been doing. As soon as I decided I was not going to let hate run me out of Cleveland, my whole world opened up. Thank you. My whole world opened up. I'll never forget the first group that reached out to me. Uh, some folks in North Olmsted said, hey, we know you're new in town. We'd love for you to come to North Olmsted. We're having our Irish American Festival. We'd love to invite you. So I went out there, and they tried to teach me the Irish jig. And Oh my goodness, I couldn't get the legs to go right, but I loved it. And then 70 and 80 year olds invited me to Parma, Ohio, and I danced the polka with a 70 year old. And I mean, it was just an outpouring of love. I was sent baklava to the station, pierogies to the station. It was like every diverse group in Cleveland was showering me with love and support. A 13 year old who had a crush on me invited me to his bar mitzvah. And uh, my gosh, that was an experience. I had never been to anything like that. But I felt so loved and protected now, not just by the black community, but whites as well. And I can tell you today, 31 years later, there is not one corner of this community that I haven't been where people, people of all walks of life, whites, blacks, Hispanics, Asian, they treat me with such warmth and kindness and love. And I, I still get emotional because I know how hard it was. And as a woman, I had to stand up. I had to stay there so that there would be more women and men who would come behind me, who would be able to have the success that I've achieved. And so I say to women, not just in television, but any career you decide that you want to achieve, if it's a male dominated. I have so many girls I talk to and they're interested in STEM. And they even tell me sometimes their professors will try and steer them in a different direction because it's still such a male dominated business. Go for what you want. If you want to be president of the United States, there, there hasn't been a woman yet, <laughs> but we know there will be. And so don't let anyone deter you from achieving your dreams. Because I am ex an example that at six years old, watching Walter Cronkite interviewing presidents and dignitaries and looking up at my mom at six years old saying, mom, one day I'm going to the White House. I'm going to interview presidents. I'm going to travel around the world. And my mom is just looking at me like, yeah, baby. And I, I don't know if she really believed that. And so imagine when a staffer walks in the room and says, Ramona Robinson of Cleveland, the president of the United States will see you now and to walk in the room and see President Obama stand up to shake my hand and ask me to be seated. And I'm seated in the same seat that a week prior the Dalai Lama had sat. And I was asking all of the staffers because it was so surreal. I was like, is this where Walter sat when he interviewed presidents? And they were like, yeah, I believe it is. And is this what Walter did? And is this? I know they were so sick of me saying Walter Cronkite. And I later heard from Walter in a letter who had heard from me. And so I just want you to know that your dreams can come true. It just takes hard work. And it's been a hard road for me. I'd ha I've had to suffer a lot of tears. But in the end, I can tell you it's beautiful. 
my Lord and Savior has been there with me throughout my life. And I, that's why in this new season, this new chapter of my life, I'm getting out, I'm, I'm writing books, testifying about the goodness of the Lord. And so I, just, I thank you for listening to me. And it's, it's so important that you hear stories like this because sometimes people look at us on the news and they immediately judge you. Oh, she's beautiful, she wears nice clothes, she has nice hair, and, and so she's had it great all her life. She's never had a problem. No, I've had problems just like you. I've had men try to abuse me, just like some of you. And if you read my book, you'll read how one of this country's top NBA players locked me in a room and tried to sexually assault me. And it was God who came and gave me the four words that would save me from that abuse. You know, I was in a relationship when I allowed a man to treat me badly, and I knew I'm like, one day the bells went off. You're a college educated woman, you're strong. Why are you allowing this? And fear, fear is the root of why we allow a number of things in our lives. We fear, I have women who tell me, I fear I can't get a better man. He kicks me around every now and then, but he's okay, because no one else is gonna want me because I got three kids, so I stay. And some people, you try to the best of your ability to raise your kids, and they don't measure up to their full potential. I get it. I get it. And thank you so much for inviting me, Mary. I, uh, the woman who taught me everything, my mom, I buried her last year at this time, and it's been so difficult because she was my rock, and I could turn to her about any and everything. But I, I told my mom last year, that I was going to leave television and I was gonna go out on my own and write my books and testify about the Lord. And, and I just knew my mom was gonna say, are you crazy? <laughs> are you really gonna leave that good paying job to do that? But my mom surprised me. She said, well, baby, I, I've taught you right. I taught you to save your money and if you can survive, then do it. Do what you think is best. And so I know I'm doing the, the right thing. So thank you so much for listening to me. <laughs> Part of um, the proceeds of my book go to children's charities that I'm passionate about. I always believe in giving back. Part of it is going to go back to the Women's Center today. Uh, but I've given to, uh, I'm sure all of you know, Coach Sam Rotigliano the former coach of the Browns, have given to his inner circle program, Saving Our Daughters, which helps girls with low self-esteem. I think to whom much is given, much is required. And so that's my motto and that's what I live by. Thank you. <laughs>